بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم Dear brothers and sisters, dear viewers, welcome to another episode of Sunnah Style. Sunnah Style, following the path of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, bringing back the love to Islam, bringing back the understanding of Islam as it was at the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, trying to present it to the youth, to reach out to the youth, to show them the beauty of Islam and to show them how they can be proud about Islam in a good way and to be good Muslims, practicing Muslims, at the same time to live in this world in this 21st century and face all the issues that they are faced with. Today's episode is a very, very special one and I have received so many questions on Facebook about this and you can connect with me on Facebook, as I said before, Gabriel Ar-Romani, Ar-Romani, A-L-R-O-M-A-A-N-I. It, this title is Spreading the Love. It is a question and it deals with the realities of zina, fornication, sexually transmitted disease, promiscuity. Why spreading the love, right, with question mark? Well, because a lot of people when it comes to sex in today's you know, time, people say, well, you know, we're just spreading the love. We're just, you know, it's just love. Yani. Why, why can I express my love to the person that I love? Does, does it have to be marriage? Does it have to be this way? Does it have to be what the Sharia says? Does it have to be, does it have to be, does it have to be? Let me just express my love. Is it just like that? Because you see, love is a beautiful concept, right? This is something that, subhanAllah, is encouraged in our deen. But again, there are restrictions. And I want to start with a beautiful hadith that outlines these restrictions in a very short term, right? Allah, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said that, that if you don't have some shyness, then do as you please. Meaning that you can do whatever you want if you don't shy away. And we find today, subhanAllah, our Muslim youth, the Ummah is faced, they look around everywhere they live, that this so-called concept of spreading the love, of you know, promiscuity, sexual relationships, just you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, just everywhere, it's being pushed through, through the media. It's being pushed through commercials, through everything. We go on the streets, we drive, we see, subhanAllah, ads on the side of the streets, you know, and as this English a saying goes, you know, sex sells, right? So people are using this, subhanAllah. They're, they're taking the modesty of women and of men and using it and destroying it and using it to make money. And people are actually, you know, falling in line with it and they're believing it and they're saying, no, it's not that bad. Everyone's doing it. It's just a form of expression. You know, I love this, I love that. And they're always using this term love in the wrong sense. So let us take this back and let us see what are the realities of these things, right? Because these are just, you know, slogans. I love you, you love me. Let us look behind at the real issues when it comes to sexual relationships. And what does Islam say about this? What is the issue of zina? Now, of course, sexual desires are something natural. No one should de deny it. And a lot of times it seems that in our community, in you know, reaching out to the to the to the older people and trying to talk to them about this, it's very hard. It's it's not easy to do. If you tell them that you know I'm attracted to this girl, I'm attracted to that you know boy, or something's happening, they'll say, "How can you say that?" Astaghfirullah. See, a man came, a, a young actually, a young man came to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he confessed that he wanted he wanted permission to commit zina, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't chastise him like that. He talked to him, he reasoned. Another man came and confessed to Prophet Muhammad that he has done everything except intercourse. And then they prayed. And then the, man, the Prophet called him back to him. And so I talked to him. So you see that he dealt with this problem. He addressed the problem. Well, today it seems that a lot of times people try to run away from this problem. It is a problem. We need to address it. This is why, you know, this, hence this show, Sunnah Sta to look at well, how does the sunnah look at this concept of, you know, of sex and so on. So I hope I grabbed your attention. And I'm sure because I am very into this, it's going to be a long subject, but very interesting. So I want to start by saying that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu himself was married. The prophets were married. This is his sunnah that they got married because this is a way of taking your desires out in the right, you know, in the right means, through the right means. So Islam recognizes sexual desires, but the fulfillment of these sexual desires are within the halal, 
within the halal. This is the, the, the restriction, subhanAllah. That Islam recognizes that we are human beings. There's going to be attraction. There's going to be desires between, you know, boys and girls and so on. But get married. Follow the sunnah. Follow the sharia way. There are responsibilities that come with this. Not just do whatever you feel like. This is what's the difference between than us and animals. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with the intellect. Has blessed us with this deeper, deeper knowledge and deeper understanding. So let us use it inshallah type in islam there is no concept of you know the monk who should not marry and should stay away and subhanallah even i was studying doing a little bit of research on some christian sects that castrate themselves right because they don't want to have that feeling those desires and flagellation and whipping themselves when they feel uh, you know the desires or attraction and and denying the nature the nature that allah has created them with you asked him, why did Allah create you with this nature and yourself with these desires, if not to fulfill them in an improper way? You find that people have gone and done these horrendous things to themselves, claiming this is part of taqwa or piety or closeness to God. So the concept of monk, oh, it does not exist. In the Catholic Church, for example, you know, the priests uh, do not marry. And I want to share with you a beautiful story of one of the uh, scholars. It is uh, Imam al-Baqilani who went and he was sent to, and he, subhanAllah, he was sent to one of the kings, one of the Christian kings of the Roman Empire. So he basically, when he entered and he saw the great priest there, he was a bit smart, mashallah, may Allah bless him, and he played this smart trick on them, right, to give them doubt. What did he say? He basically entered in and he said, how is the wife doing? And how are the children? The king was shocked. Everyone was shocked. He says, the caliph who sent you said that you were among the scholars, the knowledgeable ones. Uh, how is it that you ignore the fact that priests do not get married, that they do not have children, that we clear them from that? SubhanAllah, look at these words. Imam al-Baqilani says that you clear the priests and the monks from these things, and yet do you not clear Allah from this? You associate these things to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you deny this man, subhanAllah. Is it that you hold these people in greater status than Allah, than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Why? Because obviously they say that Allah has begotten, okay, Isa. He's begotten child, subhanAllah, he's begotten son. And not just that, even in the Catholic Church they say, uh, Mary the mother of God, subhanAllah, billah. So, People, the king, the priest, everyone was just silent. They couldn't say anything, right? I mean, if you look at it, subhanAllah, naturally speaking, this is not allowed in Islam. We need to fulfill our desires. That is correct. Establishing a family is very important, and this is done through the sexual relationship. But the halal one, the one that Allah has allowed, bringing up a good family, this is the first block of the functional society. This is the first, you know, this is like the microcosm of the society. If this society is based on proper understanding what this uh, sexual relationship is, they will raise the children who have the same understanding. And this society will be a functional society from every aspect. But if they're not, if they're corrupt, if they deny themselves, you know, the halal way and take the haram way, this will result in a dysfunctional society. These days though, it seems that it is hard to get married, subhanAllah. People are turning more and more to zina, to adultery, fornication. And of course, there is a difference between the two. The adultery is when you're married, the fornication is when you are not married. But because people have put restriction, cultural restrictions, sometimes you know, even on the concept of polygamy, right? So people start looking on in different places to fulfill their desires. People have made it very hard for the youth today, and I'm sure you are sitting today there and say, maybe you want to get married. Maybe you're ready to get married, but your parents might be making it hard on you. They might put different blocks in front of you. They might, no, you cannot marry this person. No, not that person. No, you have to marry this person. You have to wait till you get this job or you become stable. What does stable mean? I mean, subhanAllah. So the youth are looking for escapes. They're rebelling in the name of love. You know, they do these practices claiming that this is love and I love this person and I cannot hold myself and help myself, subhanAllah. So 
many cultures are pushing this type of mentality. We see it now with, you know, the concept of the global village, globalization. You know, it has become just something normal. If you don't do it, you are considered weird. You know, the concept of, you know, the virginity, keeping your virginity, saving your virginity till you are uh, older is considered something weird, almost on the way to extinction. So the cultures are pushing this. And I want to cite something. I mean, I was so shocked when I was reading this because the way people look at sexuality today is so distorted. And they start from a very early age. There is a foundation called Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research, which states that the sexual education now can start at an early age, such as three or four. Imagine that. I mean, children are being taught the concept of sex at the age of three or four. And there's been quite a few debates in a lot of the countries, even Christian countries, where, I mean, what's the right age to teach children about these things? Because if you see, and the worst things, what adds and makes it worse, is that they'll teach them the wrong concept. Okay? Now, come on, think about it, rationally speaking. Someone of the age three or four, what can they know about sex? Why can they, w this will damage them. They're not in the right psyche yet to, to be able, in the right mind to be able to understand this concept. So well, how, how can they do that? This is a foundation for medical education and research which agrees with that and gives you actually tips on how to talk to your children, to your toddlers, how to talk to them about sex when they have these questions, when they're playing mommy, daddy, when they're playing with dolls and so on. So that you can take these as educational opportunities, as, you know, as, an, as a, an opportunity to teach them about these things, subhanAllah. They say that many toddlers express their natural sexual curiosity through self you know, stimulation, that people will actually start uh, you know, self-stimulating. Boys may you know, do things and girls may do things. And it says that teach your child that masturbation is normal. This is <laughs> a foundation for medical education and research that is saying this, subhanAllah. I was shocked when I heard this, when I learned this, subhanAllah. We're I mean, we're having an amazing discussion, an amazing topic, and we'll be back with more stats and more quotations, and you'll be shocked by what you'll hear, inshallah, here on Sunnah Style after the break. Didn't I laugh to make it their way? So we need to be have to make it their way. So we need to be ready and prepared. Welcome back. We are talking about sexual education. We're talking about the concept of love. We're talking about the halal way of satisfying one's desires. Just before the break, we spoke about the, this uh, you know, quotation from the Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research, which state that sexual education can start at an early age, three or four and such. SubhanAllah, I was, as I said, very shocked when I actually read some of these things that what kind of psychological impact will it have on this child when you will present to them these things. Another thing that they say is that uh, you should teach your child that masturbation is normal. Imagine it. What, at the age of three or four? But it's a private activity. Imagine, look at this distortion, subhanAllah. Look at the, um, subhanAllah, the promiscuity that they're pushing. Look at the, the, the dirty type of understanding that they are pushing into the youth from early ages, subhanAllah. So that they'll make sure that they will become promiscuous when they are older. So they will, you know, cheat and they will lie and they will, you know, do all these bad things and have a totally dis dysfunctional sexual relationship and a dysfunctional marriage and life. So they say, you know, just teach them that it's private. It's a private activity. If your child, they say, starts masturbating in public, try to distract them and, and you know, tell them that, you know, it's not appropriate to do it in public, right? Subhanallah. And if this fails, remind your child about you know, the importance of privacy. How can a child at that age, how can a parent ever give a child such instructions? In Islam, this is haram. This is not allowed. This, rationally speaking, think about it. Think about it. How can someone teach their child that? They are not ready for anything like that. And not just that. This will lead them to be someone you know, perverted and dysfunctional when it comes to the natural sexual relationship, when they'll be married when they will have their own wives, they'll not be able to gain the satisfaction from them because they've been doing this since what? As they say, since the age of three or four. A'udhu Billah. So they're saying privacy.
They're saying, though, look at the contradiction. They say, well, sometimes frequent masturbation can indicate a problem in a child's life, a psychological problem. Well, hello, of course. <laughs> First, you're telling them, go ahead, do it in, in, in private. Don't do it in, parvi- in, pu- in public. It's your own thing. But then if it becomes frequent, then there's a problem, a psychological problem. Well, of course there's a psychological problem. You're telling them, encouraging them, teaching them, and then you're saying, well, there's a problem. It leads to addiction. Many studies and many doctors can tell you that this can lead to addiction, masturbation. So, I mean, where, look at the contradictions. And these people say with a straight face and claim that they are researchers and they're medical in the medical field and so on and so forth. So imagine that the culture is developing around these kind of ideas. And the Muslim youth are looking at it and saying, well, the doctor's saying that. Well, the, you know, I remember subhanAllah, a friend of mine who went to the doctor and said that he's suffering from stress and so on. And the, mo- the doctor told you, well, you know, you should have a girlfriend. Or you should masturbate. And he's saying, what are you talking about? I'm a Muslim. He's like, no, you're, you're stressed because of this or, you know, all these things are happening to you because of this. SubhanAllah, what kind of mentality and thinking is being pushed into the Muslim youth today? This is interesting. So they promote, they promote this immorality, which is, I, I find, the, the worst contradiction ever. A lot of Westerners and a lot of people today, liberals, have an issue with early marriages in Islam. And specifically when it comes to the, the issue of uh, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam marrying Aisha, which was a young girl at that age when she got married. Well, I wouldn't say girl, she was a young woman. Right? But they don't have, look at that, so they have an issue with that but they don't have an issue with teaching promiscuity, with teaching masturbation to children of three and four years old. SubhanAllah. They don't have an issue with that. But they have an issue when it comes to love, to marriage, to commitment. When it comes to someone at the age, because Aisha radiallahu anha was a woman, was a young woman. She reached her age, her puberty, that she could have a child now. She was a, a woman. And there was love between her and Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. There was commitment, marriage. So these people have an issue with that, but they don't have an issue with this filth. A'udhu Billah. So let's rationally think about this. Come on. Let's use our brains that God has given us and see what these people are trying to push into our Muslim youth. Let's take a few more examples. Okay? They say that when it comes to how people have sex, right? If your child wonders about the mechanisms of sex, <laughs> what do they say? They say, be honest. Okay, this is again, medical researchers, doctors, and so on. They say that you should tell them. It actually says with some specific words, and I will not quote right now for the sake of keeping you know, the integrity of the show. I will not quote right now. But subhanAllah, they, they're very explicit and vulgar in what they're saying, that you should tell your child. And it says, Consider, look at this, this is the one that really, really, you know, tops the chart. Consider using a book with illustrations or diagrams to help your child understand. To help who? Your child. Which one? Three or four years old? Five years old? Six years old? <laughs> so once you've exposed that person to this, to pictures, what will happen? Let's go back to the loop, frequent masturbation, which they call that what? there's some psychological problem. Look at the lack of rationale of these people. So, can we follow this? No, Islam teaches morality when it comes to sex. Now, it goes even worse, because, and we will touch upon this inshallah in one of the so- shows. It says, what about if they ask you, can, can, can two girls have sex or two boys? If th- they, they give you the advice that it might be enough to say that, yes, there are many types of intimate relationships. If your child wants to know more, you might take the opportunity to talk about respect for others or to share your personal thoughts about homosexuality. SubhanAllah. Look at this. And again, denaturalizing the, the fitra, the concept that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created a man for a woman and a woman from a man, f- for a man. And to just, you know, anything. Any, where does it stop? Where will it stop, subhanAllah? What about the, you know, if these perversions will move on to next things? You know, Audu Billah, people now, and they have. But now these things are accepted as culture. What about if you move to other things, other than human beings, right? That these perversions will spread, subhanAllah. So where's the limit that we ask? You Muslim youth have to use your brain to stay away from these things. And think about this, subhanAllah. Think rationally. Think about the damaging effects that these things happen. And then it goes on to say that 
explaining about masturbation, even about how to do it, subhanAllah. How nasty can these people yani, get? Audu billah. So sex, sex has been denaturalized from in sanctity, the expression of love. I mean, this is an expression of love between a husband and a wife, the gentleness between a husband and a wife. Uh, it's become now a hobby, a pastime these days, something that, you know, people are using it to, um, you know, for marketing even, subhanAllah. It's just normal, just do it. If you go to the West, find the Muslim, in the, uh, the countries in the West where Muslims live, you find that, Everyone talks about it, everyone does it, everyone brags about it even, subhanAllah. So this is a, a very problem. This is where the media comes in and the Muslims are following it. Of course, if you watch these things, now people might say, well, you know, the Muslim countries are not that bad right now. But subhanAllah, people are watching these things online. People are watching these things on TV. So of course it will influence them. I have, you know, an interesting saying. I say that, you know, the, the non-Muslims have not entered Mecca, but physically, but they have entered to the TV, for example, right? Because so many people have satellites everywhere in all the Muslim countries. They see these shows. They see these, you know, shows that are lacking morality. And then you expect them not to do these things. You expect them not to feel the desire and the attraction. If you don't know about something, of course, you cannot think about it. But if you've been exposed, you'll be given these, you know, these little sensitive, you know, impulses. Of course, you will start thinking about it. Of course, you'll start fantasizing, desiring about these things. That thought will become an action, and that action will lead you, a'udhu billah, uh, to hellfire. So let us, you know, reason and rationalize about this. I want to cite something. There's a book, book called The Erotic Revolution. It's Lawrence Lipton. And it states that of all the challenges that are sweeping the world today, the sexual revolution may well prove to be the most far-reaching far and deep-going of them all. So it has the greatest impact. Well, you might ask yourself, why? Why such a bold statement? There's been so many war wars. There's been the Industrial Revolution. There's been so many revolutions. But the sexual revolution has taken, you know, uh, has sweeped all these things away. Because the morality of humanity has changed within such a short span of time. What was considered immoral before, now it's actually encouraged. So you've seen that people have these, these ethics that are just very, very weak. They're just changing day and night all the time, going based on desires. So a society that has these kind of foundations will not survive, a'udhu billah, because it's not based on ethics and morals. So let us now analyze the damaging effects of such ignorance and lack of morality. Right? There is a paper written by Roy C. Fair of the Yale University in 1978 and published in the Kaus Foundation paper. And it's based on uh, an analysis on two empirical studies conducted by very reputed uh, journal, you know, the Psychology Today and uh, Red Book. So these studies have come up with some very, very interesting things. And this is from, this is uh, 1978. We're going to look at even earlier studies. I want to show you just the progression. This is 1978. We're talking here about almost, you know, uh, three decades ago, more than three decades ago, uh, approximately. So this it shows just the progression and development. The, the, the results are staggering. 27.2% of the first time married working men and 22.9% of the first time uh, married working women were having extramarital affairs at the time of the survey. Wow, subhanAllah, imagine. Now you might say, why? 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 We will get to why in a second. In, other sur in another survey of women, only 32, so only women in this survey, 32.2% of the first time married working women had had at least one affair during their married lives. Uh, you're talking about, you know, in the time of your parents. You're talking about before, yani our, our, our time, and we were, you know, we're either we're born, you know, I was not born in 1978, I was born in 1983. So this is, you know, we're thinking like a like long time ago. So when we look at these, this is staggering. What about today? More recent studies, okay, reveal that 45 to 55 percent of married women and 50 to 60 percent of married men engage in extramarital sex at some time or another 
during their life. This is now look at the, the increase. Even though 27 and 22 and 32 percent are huge, but now we're talking about 50, 60 percent, subhanAllah. So look at these damages, damaging effects. Look at what this type of culture that is coming up, this revolution, is bringing to the ummah. And it's affecting our youth. If it's affecting you, it's causing changes in our minds, the way we think, the way we see the deen even. It's causing effect in our, on our Islam, subhanAllah. So let us reason, let us think, let us look, inshallah, and understand and stay away from this and follow the sunnah style, the way of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and let us bring back that sanctity to the marital you know, relationship. Till the next time, inshallah, this is Jibreel on sunnah style. We will see you, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.